What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here, and today we're going to look at refractometers, the different budgets in mind, which ones are worth it, which ones aren't worth it, how to actually practice refractometry, as well as just uh, how the calculations work in general. There have been a lot of misconceptions that I've seen online, there have been a lot of new refractometers come on the market, so I thought if I would take a moment, well, a Lance moment, so probably 20 minutes, in order to dissect exactly what this is and how you can take refractions on your own and which one of these are worth it if you think, if maybe something that's $80 is worth it, all the way up to $800, where do diminishing returns come in? So, let's get going. So you may be asking, uh, why do I need to know about this? What does this have to do with me? I like watching your stuff, but I'm, I like I like when you sing, I like when you beatbox, I like when you do the weird stuff. Why are you getting into this really nerdy stuff? Well, it, it's simple. Refractions are one of the best ways in order uh, to help you dial in a coffee. So roasters use it often in quality control. People at home who are dialing in their coffees use it. People in coffee shops use it in order to dial in. It also helps you to understand the quality of certain pieces of equipment uh, to see how your grinder is doing, how your espresso machine is working, how your different putt preparation routines are working, how your extraction methods are, etc. There are a lot of ways that you can use the extraction readings and TDS readings in order to help you advance your coffee experience. Now, of course, this isn't for everyone, but there has been a big boom lately of people who really want to know how to read extractions. And with that have come a lot of cheaper options, which is fantastic to see filling the market. One of the most recent ones is this refractometer here, the dye fluid. Now, this one is a more budget option one that came out, and there have been a lot of people asking me if, if it's worth it. Of course, you also have this one, which you can find on AliExpress and maybe Amazon, um, which I don't, it doesn't really even have a name. It just says digital refractometer. Uh, on some of the online forums, people refer to it as Yellow Boy. Um, yes. Then we have, of course, the Atago, which is the original budget one. This one used to run around 300 I think it's up to about 400 US dollars now. Um, and then, of course, you have kind of the OG, the VST. This one now sits around 800, 850 US dollars. So before continuing, I want to note that um, at the beginning of this, I'm going to briefly explain what extraction yield is, what TDS is, and how we can uh, use those in order to ascertain information about our coffee. Then I'm going to move into how to calculate different extractions. One is for percolation or percolative brewing, which would be a, a V60, a Kalita, a Chemex, drip coffee, espresso. Then you have something like immersion, which would be cupping or French press. Then you have another calculation for things that are like mixed. So a, a clever with immersion and some percolation where you have AeroPress, which has pressure and it has immersion, etc. So you have three, mass, uh, three main equations to, that you would need to use. And then we're gonna end with all the data that I've collected on these four refractometers. So if you're wanting to just know the nuts and bolts of these, you can use time cues below in order to skip forward. Otherwise, if you would like to hear uh, about these different things, or if you need, if you're watching this in the future and you need to know just the best practices on how to refract, you can use time cues to get there. Anyway, let's go ahead and begin. What is TDS and what is EY? TDS refers to total dissolved solvents, and that's what these refractometers are telling us. Now, I'm not going to dive deep into how these work, but just know that it is taking the angles of the refraction of light entering the sample on the dish. So on each of these, you have a dish with a lens in the center, and this lens is reading the refractive angles, the refractive index of the sample that is on the dish. So each one of these is capable, to an extent, with, a, with a, some of them a wider margin of error than others, tells you what the percentage of the solution on your dish is actually solids, dissolved solids. That's kind of the idea. So I'm not going to get too much more into it. I'll link below. There's a great video that a friend Jay Kim did um, where he, he breaks down what, uh, what is actually happening in a refractometer. So I'm going to link that below if you want to really dive into that. Um, I don't want to make an hour video, at least not on this one, so we won't dive too deep into that here. So what TDS is, is this total dissolved solids. It's telling you essentially how much coffee is in your cup of coffee, how much is actually dissolved coffee, okay? So typically the numbers you see are in, in between one and two when it comes to filter coffee and anywhere from maybe six to 12 when it comes to espresso. 
Now those numbers are referencing percentages, percentage of your total brew. So in real, in, in, in a real example, what that would be is if you had a 200 gram that a 200 gram cup of coffee, meaning you weighed your cup without coffee, and then you had 200 grams of coffee were brewed, and you had let's say um, a 1.5 TDS. What that means is three grams of your 200 gram coffee is coffee. The rest would be water. Make sense? So you have TDS, total dissolved solids. It's usually between one and two for filter. So 1.5 TDS in a 200 gram coffee would be a three gram extraction. So let's say you have a 200 gram coffee and let's say you have 20 grams of coffee to make it. That's not real, but you had 20 grams of coffee to make it. You had, a, you had three grams in your final cup. That means three of the 20 grams were extracted. Okay, now extraction yield is talking about the amount of the bean itself that has been dissolved. So let's say you have 20 grams of beans, and let's, uh, you have 20 grams of beans, and you are uh, trying to figure out what your extraction yield is. What that means is how much of those 20 grams of beans are now dissolved? What percentage of your dose is now dissolved in your final cup, right? So if we have extraction yield, that is the percentage of your coffee that is dissolved in your cup. TDS is the percentage of your final cup that is coffee. Now, of course, these can be written out in different mathematical equations. So I'm going to move over to a whiteboard and I'm going to walk you through these different types of equations so you can further understand the algebra behind it as well as how we're going to use these equations with the information we get from these refractometers in order to ascertain the numbers we need. All right, so the first equation we're going to do is the one that you're going to likely use the most, which is the one for percolation. Now this one is E, which is your extraction, that's what we're trying to solve, equals concentration, or your TDS, times your total brew weight, all that, the product of that, divided by your coffee dose. So you essentially have your EY, just in common parlance, equals TDS times your brew weight, so your final weight, I just I always say total brew weight, divided by your dose. So if that's easier to understand, you can just do that. But anyway, more simplistically, E equals C times B over D. So this is what you're going to go to whenever you're using your TDS in order to figure out a percolation extraction. Now if you don't have uh, the original equation that um, you would use if you didn't have your beverage weight, which I don't know why you wouldn't, but if you didn't, what it looks like, so you can have an idea of how we get to this equation, is extraction yield equals concentration, or the TDS, over 1 minus your concentration divided by 100, okay? And then we're going to multiply that times the weight of our brew water. So if we did um, 16 grams of coffee to 320 grams of water, the W would be 320. That, that divided by our dose minus... L. Now L I'll discuss in a second, that's your liquid retained ratio. And then we're going, this equation roughly can be rewritten as follows. So I'm going to put the, the little roughly, cute little roughly sign. So roughly, this isn't really going to change all that much. This right here is going to be pretty minuscule. So let's take, let's take for instance, a typical, um, a typical C would be, a typical TDS would be like 1.5. So if we did 1 minus 1.5 divided by 100, that is going to be a minuscule difference from 1. So essentially, when we rewrite it, we can just put C. So pretty much just the TDS. The only time this really comes into play is if the C is really high. So something like espresso, uh, something that has a, a high C. High C, that's funny. So if we had a 10 TDS, for instance, that would be 1 minus 10 over 100. Right? That'd be 1 minus 1 tenth. So that would be 0.9. So what we would have here is 1 over 0.9. And that can actually cause a bigger difference. Right? But for all intents and purposes, we're going to just have C here. And then we, we will multiply that by W. So that's total brew water over dose. And then minus liquid retained ratio. We'll talk about this in a second, but that is roughly... Two. So that is how we get this equation, but of course we can simplify it with this right here. So whenever you're doing extraction yield, that's what you're going to go for. That's how we're going to get our extraction yield for percolation. Perk. What's that smell on your shirt? It's that perk. 
All right, next up we have the equation for immersion brews. Now this one is a little bit more complex than the simplicity of the first one, but we'll get through it. Extraction equals C, that TDS, divided by 1 minus C over 100, so that's, that's familiar, we saw that just a second ago, times the total weight of your water divided by your dose, okay? So this is what you'll need to use in order to ascertain your immersion, because in your immersion brews, you have, you're not, uh, uh, you have your water in it the whole time. You're not percolating. So you use the full amount of water right here. Now we can roughly translate that as the following equation. Just like last time, we can essentially negate this because how small that is going to impact it, since it likely won't be that high of a number. And we're going to say it's just C times W, all that, over D. So we have TDS times total water divided by your dose. So this is what we'll do for something like cupping or French press. This is your immersion. For the final equation, we have the mixed phase brews. Now this is something like a siphon or a clever dripper or an aeropress. Now this is the most intense equation of them all. I do have a shortcut, which I'll show you right after showing the equation. So of course we start with E, our extraction yield, equals, then we have a big old parentheses, the concentration of your beverage, so your full cup TDS, minus the concentration of the last few drops. Now that literally means the last few drops like coming out of an AeroPress, you would gather those and you would refract them. And you would divide that by one minus the concentration of your last, so the TDS of those last few drops, divided by 100. Okay, then we'll end the parentheses there. Then what we're going to do is we're going to multiply that by the beverage weight divided by your dose. Then we're going to add that. We're going to come all the way back over here. We're going to add that to the concentration of your last few drops divided by 1 minus the concentration of your last few drops divided by 100, close parentheses, and we'll multiply that times W over D. And then you just got a few plug and plays and some algebra to do. Make sure you remember your PEDMAs, and you'll be good to go. This is how you'll get the extraction of your mixed phase. Now, if you want to skip all of that, I'll put a link below to a website by my friend who runs Waste of Coffee. And he has created a calculator for Clever Siphon AeroPress so that you don't have to fool with all of this junk. Okay, so check that out in the caption below if you do a lot of these types of brews and you want accurate extraction yield readings. So in those equations, you heard some words like um, liquid retain ratio or maybe or, or something like that. Anyway, I want to explain what these what some of those terms mean. So liquid retain ratio, which is referred to as LRR. Sorry, excuse the handwriting. Um, LRR, what that is referring to is the water that has been absorbed in the coffee grounds. So let's say we have uh, coffee grounds. Obviously, they're not shaped like spheres, but we have coffee grounds. So we have inside of here is where we have water that's retained. So we've got, we have water that's extracting the, the solubles inside, but it never actually diffuses out of the grounds. So liquid retain ratio is usually a uh, is usually around two times what your dose is. So usually what that, what that would mean is um, L, L equals roughly. So I should actually put the roughly symbol roughly two times dose, right? So roughly it's two times dose, and that's the that's usually the assumed number. There is two. You double your dose. So if you have uh, twenty grams of coffee water has the capability of, of absorbing about 40 grams, uh, or coffee has the capability of absorbing about 40 grams of water. So that's, that's what liquid retain ratio is. Now, the other thing is interstitial water. Now, this is different than this. So interstitial water is at the end. Let's say we have a V60, and these are massive grounds, or uh, we have V60 here. Interstitial water is after we're done brewing, there is still water caught 
inside the bed that doesn't all escape. So there's this massive ground that's holding it back. This ground is uh, Gandalf. You shall not pass. And so we have this interstitial water that cannot escape. But there is water in there. And guess what water's been doing? It's been extracting some of these little particles. So inside these water streams, inside these little water currents, there's extra extractants. Now, I know I'm an artist. Um, you probably are, are just taken aback by how beautiful my, my, my drawing is. But that's, that's kind of the difference there. So you have liquid retain ratio, and you have interstitial water. So if you hear either of those things ever, if you're reading and you see those, that's what they mean. There's a big difference there. The interstitial water is something that, for instance, Scott Rayo, I'll put a, a post he made from 2017, talks the, about the importance of um, LRR is what is used in some of those calculations. Um, I have a lot of resources in the caption below, so please take the time to look through them. If you are super anal and you really want to get down to precision to a 100th of a percent, well, I have Jonathan Gagne, uh, astrophysicist up in Canada. He has this really intense um, way of going about doing it. He's changed some of it since, but below you have um, you have a, a, a really intense methodology, essentially. You also have uh, A Waste of Coffee, which is a blog I've put down below, his way of doing it as well. So now that we know the calculations, how do we actually get these measurements? What is the system, the methodology, in order to get these? Well, for percolation, there is a certain way, and then when you use immersion or the mixed brewing, uh, there's another way. And now what I mean by that is you can pretty much unfilter with percolation, like not use a filter, use an unfiltered sample unless it's espresso. And then for espresso immersion in the mix, you're going to want to filter those samples if you're trying to be as accurate as possible. Now, if you're just doing this as a home brewer or you're just trying to see relative differences and you're not actually trying to be super anal about the measurements, then you don't really need to filter it. But with all the colloids, the oils, the, the, the fines, particulates, all these things that get into your sample, you're going to have a really inflated uh, um, TDS reading, so a really, in, in which small, small differences on your TDS reading, you're going to have catastrophic differences in your extraction yields. So if you're wanting to measure uh, and, and truly see the efficacy of something, you're going to want to use some, some sort of filter. Now, one such filter is the BST filter. Now, this goes with a syringe. And then you have the filter itself, which is this cute little guy. Now the issue is, or these these are single-use filters, uh, so it's plastic waste. It's expensive. It's just not great. So I actually don't use them very often at all because I'm not often really trying to prove I can hit a thousand extraction yield and prove to everyone that I've got the best extraction theory. That's that's not that's not my bag. Now I did use it in my methodology for testing all these, which we'll get into here in a second. But essentially, what you do is you draw your you draw your sample into the syringe like so, and then once you have your sample in there and you have it cooled, which I would wait until it's cooled, that's a very big thing we'll talk about here in a second, you screw on the filter and then you just squeeze it on out. So you can either wait till it's cooled in here or you can squeeze it into some sort of um, closed container so that you can uh, allow it to cool in there. But Anyway, so we have uh, the filter for something that we need to filter, obviously, or unfilter. Now, the way that we go about getting these samples is uh, Gagne suggests a glass pipette. A lot of people use these plastic pipettes. Um, there's also a, a, new, a new movement towards using a, what's called a double spooning technique. But the most important thing to know is that when you're getting your sample, you need to ensure that it's contaminant-free. So you don't want to, I would never reuse a plastic pipette. I've heard people say that they clean them properly, but there's just no real way to do so. Um, glass pipettes, you can use uh, pipe cleaners and different things like that, and you can, you know, uh, uh, wash them and all these different things. Plastic is difficult, and I just don't really like that people buy 100, 500 of these. It's just, it's just really wasteful. But with any of these methods, regardless of how you take the sample, one of the most crucial elements in reading your TDS is to allow the sample to cool to room temperature. Okay, the reading temperature needs to be within 0.2 Fahrenheit, 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit. That is very small within, from, the, from the temperature of your zero water. So whenever you calibrate your refractometer, whatever the temperature is of the water there, you need to be within two tenths of a Fahrenheit degree. Okay, so uh, whenever you are measuring, temperature is very, very important. Now, you don't want to just sit there and let it evaporate the whole time because that can give you a bad reading when it's really, really hot. So keep it in a closed container, something like if you have a syringe, it's closed. You can keep it closed in there before you, uh, before you filter it out. And so as it's sitting and it's evaporating, you are able to reincorporate the water that's evaporated if it's in a closed container by shaking it right before you distribute 
the solution. So evaporation can skew to an extent what you're, what you're reading. Once it's at room temp, evaporation is not really going to matter. So once you have your sample on the dish and it's room temp, you're not really going to have any issues. Now, if you put it while it's hot, it's going to take a really long time for it to cool down and evaporation will likely be an issue. So it's best to have some sort of closed container whenever you take your samples and then giving it a shake before you place it on the dish. Once it's on the dish, you're going to want to hit the read button until it reads the same amount, probably about uh, around five times. That's going to give you your true TDS to the extent of what your refractometer can do. Now, before using your refractometer, what is very important to do is to clean it with isopropyl alcohol. Now, what, the way I like to do it is I just get a jug of isopropyl alcohol. I put it in a little dropper, and I just drop a few, uh, drop one or two drops on here, or you can put it in a little spray bottle and mist it with some alcohol, and then take uh, at what I like to use an eyeglass wipe in order to wipe it off. Now, this is of utmost importance when you're using anything outside of the VST to use something like an eyeglass uh, the cloth. If you're using a paper towel or something like that, think about this. Would you use a paper towel on your bifocals? Likely not, because those can cause microabrasions. Now, the reading sensor on the BST is a sapphire, is made of sapphire, so it is, it's not going to scratch uh, under normal conditions. But the Atago, probably the dye fluid, and I've got to imagine Yellow Boy, uh, all of them are, are going to be able to scratch. So if you've been using paper towels on your Otago and you're wondering why you have erratic readings, we've probably scratched it and it's probably reading skewed refractions. So make sure that you're very careful with what you're wiping that dish off with. This, these are highly precise instruments and the, this is something that you need to take seriously if you're going to invest into it. You don't want to just kind of have this that you beat around just because it has a rubber coating on it. This is, these, are, these are scientific tools. They are something that need to be respected and to be cleaned really well, really sterile, etc. So we're going to do a couple of drops of the alcohol. Some people use alcohol wipes. It's fine with BST. Again, those can be rough on occasion. I probably wouldn't, I don't use them on the Atago or these other ones. Um, and it's just cheaper to buy a big old thing of, of alcohol and you can just wipe and you can always wash these in a washer. So I, I do a, a couple of drops, wipe it off. Then you want to clean it again with distilled water. If you zero with, uh, right after you use alcohol, you can, you're going to zero it incorrectly. The, the, if that can skew the reading. Having out any type of alcohol residue on there is going to skew the reading. You don't want that. So make sure you clean it after you clean it with alcohol, clean it with distilled, and then zero. Now when I say zero, that you're calibrating. You're essentially saying this is what is true water. And so a lot of people ask, why don't we calibrate using our brew water? Well, I'm going to leave that for the scientists. All I know is um, I've been told by the scientists to use distilled water. So I'm not even going to try to feign that I know. But what I do know is every coffee scientist I know, uh, including Gagne and Samo and different people, uh, all say to use distilled. And I've got to imagine that has something to do with, um, with how, how it's reading refractions and how that is just setting the bar at ground zero. Now, I know that you're going to say, yeah, but brew water is what we are, uh, we're adding to the brew water element. But I think it has more to do with the fact that you're calibrating a machine to hit specific uh, refractive ind indices. And it's important to use distilled because there's nothing really in it. And that's what you're telling the machine. This is nothing. So tell me what is in something that has something. That's my best way. So I, I said I wasn't going to feign. I just I feigned. So, but what's going to happen is we're going to get like 20 people who are qualified to say why we need to use distilled. And I'm sure we're going to have even more people tell me why I'm wrong. We need brew water. But you'd be arguing with people who are smarter than me, and I'm okay with that. All right. So we're going we're gonna to zero out with distilled, and then we're going to wipe it clean again. And you want to make sure that the dish is room temperature. Now, if that means zeroing and then leaving the water in there because the water is probably at room temp and leaving it until the dish cools down, that's good. You don't want these dishes hot at all. They need to be room temperature because, of course, temperature means so much in this. And I have in the caption below, again, a lot of fantastic resources, and some of them show, especially some of Gagne's posts, show the drastic difference that temperature can make. There, uh, one of the charts that he has shows that the... Um, at the proper proper room temperature, so it had high temp over here, low temp over here, and you have an increasing TDS on the y-axis. When it was at the proper room temp, it was at 145, but as it was hotter and hotter and hotter, it was going down. The TDS was down to almost like a 1.23 or something at about 85 Fahrenheit. So it's very important to make sure you have what uh, within 0.2 Fahrenheit 
of your room temp water, of what you calibrated with, okay? Now, what I like to do for the double spoon method is I take my Umeshiso uh, Onyx collaboration spoon and the Umeshiso James Hoffman, Daddy Hoff collaboration spoon, and what I like to do is I will take a sample and I go back and forth between the two. So I'll take a sample into this metal spoon and the spoon has uh, a, a lot of thermal mass and it sucks a lot of that heat out. Now, Gagne did another study, which is again down below. Well, and he was showing how plastic versus metal, how they um, give off evaporation. And there's a lot less evaporation when he had something stored in metal. So using metal versus uh, using something sort of like plastic. Anyway, so I'm gonna, I take it out and I let it cool in this, which is gonna cool it a lot faster than doing it in some sort of pipette. Now, plastic pipette, you're gonna have to wait 10, 15 minutes, even for like a one milliliter uh, sample, because this plastic's gonna wanna keep it hot. So you're gonna have to wait 15 minutes or so unless you cool it down under running water, which is actually a good idea if you don't allow water to contaminate your sample. We're gonna pot, put it here, kinda kinda shock it, and then I kinda go back and forth and then just lay it down onto my refractometer. And so that allows me to get it down to room temp really quickly, which I really, I love because it quickens the process quite a bit. Um, then when you're done, you can just, you can pipe it off or actually I just take my refractometer and pop in the sink like that. That's the Lance move right there. Then after you get the sample off, what I like to do personally is I get a little, little squirt bottle and I like to hold this off to the side and squirt with distilled water. I don't, I, uh, because I don't want to, um, I don't want to use any of my, uh, any of these little glasses, wide microfiber towels. I don't want to get coffee on any of these, like ever. I don't want coffee oils to get on them as best as I can. So I kind of take like this, squirt so it kind of drains off, and then hopefully it's just kind of water with maybe a little coffee residue, wipe that off and it keeps this a little bit cleaner. Um, and then you're kind of done. Now, when you're doing espresso or some, some, some sort of immersion brew or something that's a lot thicker with a lot more of that uh, substance to it, I would recommend cleaning with alcohol and zeroing a lot more frequently than if you were doing filter brews, all right? Now, uh, between these, there are there's differences between how often you need to zero your refractometer. Uh, with something like this, um, I'm gonna go and spoil it. I found I need to zero this pretty much every use. Um, yeah, we'll get more to that later. Uh, the VST, however, you rarely need to zero. When I say rarely, I still think you do it probably every five, every five or so readings, maybe even more with espresso. A tago with espresso, maybe every other reading with filter, maybe every five. Um, anyway, so you're, you're going to want to be pretty intense about zeroing it out because that can greatly skew your reading. So real quick, a breakdown of how to do the reading. We're going to obtain our sample without getting allowing contaminants. Using, using something like this is fantastic because it disallows contaminants from hitting your sample as it's sitting there being read. So having contaminants get in the sample is a big no-no. So I'm not a big fan of the plastic pipettes. They're too disposable. They're not reusable really. Um, and I, th they hold temperature too long and I'm just, I'm just not a big fan. Glass pipettes work, but they're a pain in the bum to keep clean and to use and use and use. Um, I, I've been using the double spoon method with great replicability. Um, uh, the, the way that we clean, of course, is with alcohol, uh, wiping it clean and then using distilled always after you do alcohol and then zeroing after you clean with distilled. Then we're going to put our sample on after it's to room temperature. We're going to read until we have a stable reading five times. We're going to do the lance move, toss it off, and then we're going to spray it with some distilled or drop some distilled, clean it off, and we're good to go. So. That's kind of a basic methodology on how to read. Of course, I have a more intense version, a couple of them in the caption, so I want to reiterate, go look at that. This is called the, the Tago Magic. It is a little piece of metal that acts as a cap on top of the Tago. Now, what I love about this, maybe more than anything, is that it acts as a heat sink. So that is a, just a big old thick piece of stainless steel. When you put it on top of your sample, it sucks the heat rapidly so that it gets down to room temp like immediately. So I use this like always when I'm using the Atago. So the issue with the Atago is this, the sensor is actually much bigger than on the VST. So when we're looking at it, look at the two sensors. The diameter on the VST is much smaller than that on the Atago. So you actually need quite a bit more coffee sample in the Atago to get an accurate reading. Well, the more sample you put on your dish, the more potential particulates you have on that dish, the more potential for a misreading with the refractive index. Does that make sense? I know you're thinking, well, it should be the same throughout. One drop versus 10 drops should have the same proportionally. Well, that's correct. But 
you have more sample, you're going to have more floating around and more potential for light to skew in a specific way. So what the, what the magic does, or what a lot of people like to colloquially call the mushroom, because it looks like a little mushroom, what it does is it allows you to use even less sample, and it pushes and smushes out the sample. So not only does it smush out the sample so you can use less drops, it also smushes it out to give it a thinner layer, which cools it off quicker, and also have a, has a big thermal mass, which also cools it off quicker. And finally, it gives it a cap. The Tago doesn't come with a cap, BST does, gives you a cap so no other contaminants can mess with it. So it's great. Now I wouldn't, this I would not say it does a good job at stopping evaporation because that doesn't really matter once, like I said, once it's you know close to room temp. So I wouldn't really worry about that, but everything else is a big deal. Now, one of the big issues with it is this thing you have to treat just like you do the dish. If there's a nick in this, if it is not perfectly clean the same way you're cleaning this, you're gonna have a skewed reading. So the, re 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 the repeatability of it is really high, and it gives you a really, a really good reading uh, if, as long as you keep it really clean. Now, someone, um, Renegade Guru on Espresso Aficionado Discord uh, machined a couple of these for the Yellow Boy. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's different ones for, uh, for all of these. Now, I've been using one of these that, he, uh, that Renegade Guru made for that onto the dye fluid, and it's actually helped a little bit. Uh, because the dye fluid seems to be a bit erratic, which we will now get into for real. Okay, the final bit you finally hear. Maybe you skipped to this part because that's all you cared about, and you missed just the best video of all time. Um, or, or, or maybe you've been sitting here the whole time, and you know why it's the best video of all time. So, um, let's just get into it. We have the four here. We have the VST, which is the OG. We have the Atago, which is um, which is the, kind of the original budget one. We have the Dye Fluid, which is a recent big hit on Instagram and on different social medias. And then we have the Yellow Boy, which is big on a lot of online forums. Now, I did a lot of testing. I literally, yesterday, this is not a joke. If you follow me on Instagram, you know this. I spent about 10 hours in all yesterday uh, just brewing and refracting. It took forever. Um, and the samples that I, I was making sure I had the, the best work workflow. A few times I did a few samples and realized there's something I could do that was even better. And I mixed those samples until I found the best workflow. And I took, I got um, my last 10 samples of filter brews and then five samples of filtered uh, espresso brews. And I have all that data that I'm going to give you right now. It's on the screen. So you can kind of look it through that. Well, I'll have it down below, but I wanted to give you just a, just a little bit, a little teaser of it. But essentially, what, uh, what I did was the, the exact, uh, I mean, the exact methodology I told you earlier on how, to, on how to read these. And so I was making sure that I had the samples cool. I was making sure that everything was clean. And honestly, I had to zero. At, at, with espresso, I started to zero after every single reading because I was getting a little inconsistency, especially with these three. And so I just started to zero every time. And so, uh, there's a couple times after two readings I had to re-zero the VST. So I just wanted to be really intense about this. I literally bought filters just for this video to be above reproach um, in order to make sure that I had the best data possible. So what I found within those 10 filter brews and what I found within those five espresso brews is that the Atago and the VST are virtually identical. Now when I say that, there was a there was a bigger difference in espresso, but you can have a bigger difference in espresso and it not really affect your extraction units. In filter, however, because it's much smaller TDSs, a small difference can affect a big change. So a 0.01% change in filter is much bigger than a 0.01% change in espresso. And if you look through the data that I posted there, you're gonna see the different extraction yields whenever you have differences, even to the hundredths. There's bigger differences. and so. Uh, I, want, I want you to no note that these two were very similar, even though on espresso there was a bigger difference. The dye fluid on filter was erratic. It was kind of just everywhere. Sometimes it was two or three tenths above what I was reading here. Sometimes it was below. And then sometimes, as it sat there, even at room temperature, for fun, I would hit read again. After, after five or ten minutes after I've already collected the data, I'd hit read again, and it would go up another tenth, or another two tenths. It was just kind of all over the place. And then the yellow boy just read under the whole time. It was, um, and it's only to the tenth, which is not ideal. So on, on these, you want resolution to the one 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 hundredth of a percent. That's kind of what we're hoping for. Now, when, uh, and especially because most people are using scales that are inadequate, including myself, 
the Kyle Lunars, I think, have a plus or minus 0.2 gram uh, margin of error. Mitch Hale, who said that, uh, which is a waste of coffee, he said that if you have a, a scale that's worse than 0.1 gram margin of error, then you only really need to give your extraction yield to a tenth because after that, it's uh, the variability is too high to really mean, mean anything sufficient. So whenever sharing your extraction yields, you should really just give all the information that you have and just round to the tenth because going to the 100th is not is not as accurate anyway. Um, if you have, if you don't have a super accurate scale, anyway. So with these, we want to increase our accuracy as much as possible. You want it to a one one hundredth. So honestly, right out the gate, that kind of negates the yellow one for me because that means. If you have a 136 to a, uh, or a 135 TDS all the way up to 144, this is just going to read a 14. And that's assuming it's calibrated with these other ones, which it's not. If I had a 156 on the VST, usually the yellow boy would read a 14. So it was quite off, and it only goes to the tenths. So I don't really trust this one. Even with the mushrooms that I used, I still was not getting um, uh, consistent readings, which obviously is not what you want whenever you're using a refractometer. So this one, I'm just going to go ahead and push to the side. Now we have these three. I already touched a little bit on the dye fluid. Its filter was pretty horrendous. It was a little bit better in espresso. There are a few times it actually read quite closely to these two, but it was unreliable. And the thing that I found out, like I said, is if it sits there for a bit, you essentially have a small window where you could get an accurate reading. But the only reason I knew it was an accurate reading is because I was calibrating with these two. So there I would hit it. What was interesting is right when I hit read, if it was, let's say, these two red espresso at a 9 TDS, I would hit read and the first reading would say 7. And then it would go up. I would hit read again, it'd go to 8.1. And I'd hit read again and it'd go to like 8.18. And I'd hit read again. While these are already finished, uh, and this is a much smaller sample size, this dish is minuscule, takes maybe two drops. I would hit read again, and it would move another one one hundredths. And then I'd be like, okay, well, it stabilized after five readings. So I'd take it, and it would be six tenths below these two. Then I, afterwards, out of curiosity, I'd hit read again, and it would jump up five tenths. Something crazy. It, maybe not five tenths, but it would jump up uh, like at least one tenth or two tenths. Some, it, it, there was one time it did jump two tenths, and it scared me. Um, so this one's just a little erratic um, in its current form. I know they're working on another version with um, some apparently pretty neat technology. We'll see what goes on there. But in its current form, I do not recommend um, either the yellow boy or the dye fluid because they're just going to give you inaccurate results. Now, if they were consistent, I think that would be helpful. But neither, neither of them were consistent, meaning if we were to take these as our gauges, if they were to have been consistently like below, and we're following it consistently, that's great. I don't really mind that. But the issue is if these were the, the goals and they're moving like so, the other ones were kind of jumping around it. So it's not going to give you reliable data. It's, it can give you really inflated numbers, especially the dye fluid. The yellow one, I've seen people with inflated numbers. I've seen people with lower numbers. It, it, those are just hit or miss. If you're going to get into refractometry, I would recommend saving up to get one of these until a better alternative comes out. Now, again, you don't need to refract your brews, especially if you're a home barista. If you're a cafe, I think it's worth investing in something like the BST or the Atago. So now, anyway, we're down to these last two. This is the Battle Royale. This is what I had for forever. I just got this one recently. Um, which one do, do, do I think it's worth going up, essentially, in price to get the VST? If you have the expendable income, yes. Uh, the VST is so easy to use. It's a joy. It quickly stabilizes the reading. You, you don't have to fool around. You don't have to be that gentle with it. It's, it's absolutely incredible. But, as I said, the readings were incredibly similar with the Atago. If you have patience, if you are a very anal type of person that is going to clean it really, really, really well, use only things that aren't going to scratch it, only things that aren't going to leave lint or anything like that, if you're going to be <clears throat> gentle with it and patient with it, I do love the Atago. And in fact, personally, something that I absolutely adore about the Atago that I wish VST did, so if you're watching VST, please do this in future iterations, is they have an NFC chip in here. So what that means, if you're wondering, is if you download, and I found this out actually last night from my friend Rohan in my Discord, in the Hedrick Cord is what he calls it, um, is if you have the NFC Tool app, what you need to do with that app is you just start putting it near the back of the refractometer, and eventually it will buzz once you find the chip. And just like that, we have pulled up 
the information from this refractometer. Now what this information shows is a lot of mumbo jumbo that I don't really know. But if you don't know, NF NFC is what allows you to uh, pay by tap. So it, it scans that. Anyway, so it scans the NFC in here. And not just the, the their old Otago's Chris Farron um, um, went and checked his, which doesn't have the NFC, which is actually on the refractometer here. I didn't notice that actually. Uh, but he went and checked his that doesn't have that, and it has the NFC in it as well. So if you have an Otago, you may have this. But essentially, if you scroll down, you have a log of the last, I don't know, at least 100, of the last 100 or so of your refractions. And so what this allows you to do is to go and check if, you are, if your readings are within two-tenths of a Fahrenheit of your last zero. So you can go through and you can find where you zeroed it. You can see what the temperature was, which when I zeroed it, it was 24.9. Now, take the readings on the Atago with a grain of salt. It was not 24.9. Um, room temperature was not, but uh, it, it, it's fine. It, it, it's it's more, mostly about um, the relative numbers, right? So 24.9. So I can go through and look at my readings and see if I was within two-tenths of a Fahrenheit of 24.9. And like I have here, 24.7, 24.7, 24.9, 25, 25, 25.1. So you, uh, we're, we're within those 0.2. So that's kind of the, the, the goal is that 0.2. I can't stress that enough. But anyway, that's something that's really neat about the Atago. You can use that NFC and tap with your phone and you can get a log. The VST, at least from my sitting and doing it, um, doesn't seem to have that. Uh, but it does have a really cool app that comes with it, which I want to speak really quickly about before we end. The app on the VST has a built-in um, it has a built-in bit in the equation that takes into account CO2 and moisture in the coffee. And so you can have different numbers using the VST app than if you were to manually do your equation. Now, is it probably more accurate to use that? Probably, but most people don't use that app when they're doing the equations. I don't even use it. I actually just do it quickly on my calculator. Um, so anyway, so it, when sharing your extraction yields, I would just do that one equation we looked at, which is, well, if you're doing filter or, or percolation of any sort, which is your TDS times your brew weight divided by your dose. That's how I would communicate extraction yield in order to make sure people are on the same level. Of course, you can always give them all of your information, which would be your TBS, which would be your uh, brew weight, which would be your dose. But anyway, I hope this was helpful. I hope it's not a bummer to see that you still need to spend a few hundred bucks in order to get a good refractometer. I hope this is um, you know, a, a call for more people to innovate and to make cheaper alternatives. I really, 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 really want a cheap alternative. I don't want people to have to spend more than, say, 150 bucks for something that can give them a pretty good reading. I know that might be asking too much, but, you know, technology is getting to a point where it's pretty nuts, so I'm hoping that soon we'll have that capability. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video, I'm going to ask that you will please hit that like button, hit the subscribe, leave a comment, maybe share it, you know, copy the link, whatever, all that stuff really helps. Uh, push my video um, and, you know, use this in a curriculum, uh, you know, use it as a reference, do whatever you want. Please use the caption below as a work cited to go and fact check things that I've said, but also to uh, look at the great work that those people have done. Uh, give them follows on their blogs, on their socials, etc. Anyway, thank you so much. I hope you brew something tasty today and cheers.